Christ is risen today. And that is why we have gathered here today on this Easter Sunday to celebrate the risen Christ. My name is Brandon Frenzel. I'm one of the pastors here at First Methodist Church, and I greet you in the name of Jesus, for he is why we have gathered today and every Sunday. This morning, I hope that you'll take a moment to register your attendance with us on the app, that you'll take a moment to share our feed with others on your social media feeds as we go live and we send this broadcast out all over the place. Today, we celebrate the risen Christ, and I invite you to sing, to celebrate that he has pierced the darkness, that he has been raised from the dead, and he dwells among us today. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. Sons of men and angels say, Alleluia. Raise your joys and triumphs high. Alleluia. Sing ye heavens and earth reply. Alleluia. Lives again our glorious King. Alleluia. Where, O oh, death, is now thy sting? Alleluia. Dying once he all doth save. Alleluia. Where thy victory, O oh, grave. Alleluia. Love's redeeming work is done. Alleluia. Fought the fight, the battle's won. Alleluia. Death in vain forbids him rise. Alleluia. Christ hath opened paradise. Alleluia. Soar we now where Christ has led. Alleluia. Following our exalted head. Alleluia. Made like him like him we rise alleluia ours the cross the grave the skies alleluia this morning we have the opportunity to once again affirm our faith together as christians have been gathering for 2000 years celebrating the risen christ we again gather this Sunday, this Easter Sunday, to celebrate who we are and what we believe. I invite you to gather your family to join together and say these words on the screen with me as we say the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Would you pray with me? Holy God, we bless your name and we give you thanks for what today means. For when you entered into the world and you brought us grace through your son, Jesus, you changed the trajectory of humanity forever and you brought love and hope close. And so in days such as these, when the church is worshiping differently and we are gathering differently than we ever have, one thing has not changed and that is the fact that the tomb was empty. 
Lord, the story didn't end with the death on the cross, but Lord, you were raised from the dead, Jesus, and so you are alive, and we celebrate that today that you are with us. So God, hear our prayers. Meet us in these moments. Speak into our stories and into our lives. Bring hope to those that are in despair. Lord, bring comfort and friendship to those that are lonely. We ask that as your light rushes in on Resurrection Sunday for people all over the globe, that you would bend the darkness back, that your hope and grace would be real and present to us. Lord, hear our prayers. Teach us your ways, just as Jesus taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from John chapter 20, verses 24 through 28. Hear these words. Now Thomas, called Didymus, was one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God, we give God thanks for his promises in his word. The city was unsettled. People were huddled in their homes, in family units and small groups with the doors locked for fear of what was going on outside. In Jerusalem, over 2,000 years ago, people had watched with great wonder and hope as This man, Jesus, who had accumulated a great following throughout the nation, came riding into the capital city. Thousands upon thousands turned out to wave palm branches and to hail him Hosanna, to lay their cloaks down on the road in front of him, to declare this is the son of David, to welcome a coming king into their midst. And yet, in the span of one week, the hopes of all those who had gathered to cheer him were seemingly dashed when he was betrayed by one of his own. He was arrested. He was tortured. Put through a mock trial, a farce, and sentenced to death. Crucified between two hardened criminals. Observed in his suffering and pain by his mother, his friends, and his friends who had become family. It was a dark time in their life, and really it was a dark time in humanity's life. When the hope of the world, the Savior come from heaven suffered and bled, was broken on the cross, died and was buried in the tomb. And the world keeps turning. And yet now we find ourselves in a moment where our city is unsettled where things are anything but normal, where the events of our time and the events of our day have isolated us one from the other. We too are living behind locked doors, afraid of what is out there and its possible impact and effect on us. Just as those first disciples were huddled in a moment of great anxiety and uncertainty, The only thing they knew for sure was that life was never going to be the same again. They knew that the life they had been living following Jesus had come to a close. But they didn't know what was going to happen next. Would they be arrested? Would they be sentenced? Would they too be crucified? They didn't know how long they would be in hiding and they didn't know what the next day might bring. It was to this group of people who were living in anxious, uncertain moments, who had had their hopes and dreams dashed seemingly beyond repair, that Jesus shows up to. That Jesus, in leaving the grave behind, makes his presence known to. First to the women who had 
come to the tomb to anoint his body, to perform the funeral rites on their beloved friend, Jesus calls them by name and alerts them to his presence, to his resurrection. And then later, going into one of those locked rooms where most of his disciples were assembled, revealing himself to them, sharing the truth of his resurrection. On his first appearance behind those locked doors in one of the homes where the disciples were huddling, one of their number was not present. He had evidently gone out. I don't know how it was that Thomas got the short straw that maybe he had to go out and fight the lines at the local HEB to get some toilet paper and paper towels, to get some critical supplies for the disciples that were huddled there in hiding. Perhaps he was the the least uh, susceptible to whatever trials and tribulations might be out there for a disciple who was on the streets in those days. But for whatever reason, Thomas was not present when Jesus first made his appearance in that house where the disciples were locked in together. And so it was that he found himself receiving the news of Jesus' resurrection secondhand. He he became one of the first people to hear about Jesus' resurrection, not from Jesus himself, but from those who Jesus had already appeared to. In John's Gospel, chapter 20, verses 24 and following, we read, These words. I hope you'll open up your Bibles wherever you are to John chapter 20 and look at these verses with me today. If wherever you are um, today, you do not have a Bible, I hope that you'll contact us, that you'll let the church know because we will get one out to you. Either we will drop it off at your doorstep if you're local in Waco, or we will put one in the mail to you wherever you might be in the world. We want for you to have the Word of God because in here is everything necessary for salvation. And we would love for that to be our gift to you on this Easter. John chapter 20, beginning at verse 24. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. Now Thomas, uh, through this exchange, received that dubious uh, title of doubting Thomas, but let's be fair to the man. He no doubt watched like the others did as Jesus was taken away by the authorities. He knew of his suffering, of his passion, that he was whipped and beaten, probably watched him dragging that cross through the streets of Jerusalem. Watch as he was hammered in. He knew about the holes in his hands. He knew about the wound in his side. So no doubt Thomas was among those who watched Jesus die. And now he comes home from whatever errand he had been on. He does the secret knock that allows the disciples to open the door. And they greet him with the news, we've seen Jesus. You just missed him. He was right here. Now, I don't know if you would put yourself into that same position, whether or not you might also be a bit of a doubter. I'll confess that I would be. If I had just come home from awake celebrating the life of a loved one of mine to the news that that person had just made an appearance, I might be a bit skeptical. I might demand to see evidence for myself. And so Thomas does. And in fact, Thomas tells the other disciples, I don't just want to see him. I don't want a vision. I don't want a dream. He says, I'm not going to believe it's true unless I can see his scars. Unless I can put my finger into the holes in his hand and probe the wound in his side. You know, you and I may be 
more like Thomas than any of those other disciples. We too have to receive a a, a witness from others, a, a witness from friends and family, a witness from someone at some point in our life that, hey, I have met the resurrected God His name is Jesus Christ, and He has forgiven and freed me from my sins, and He has given me new and everlasting life. Each one of us, at some point along the way, has to receive that witness that is secondhand. But I suspect that for most of us, unless we are able to verify that through an encounter of the resurrected Jesus ourselves, it's going to be hard for us to truly believe, at least believe in a way that radically reorients the entirety of our life. If I'm going to stop living the way that I am, and I'm going to radically reorient my entire identity away from life being just about me, then I'm going to have to have some convincing proof that Jesus is who he says he is, that he really is alive forevermore. I suspect we're a lot more like Thomas than almost any other disciple. And Thomas speaks from the heart. He says, look, I I don't want to meet a ghost of Jesus. I I, I don't know that much about the afterlife or how it works, but I'm going to tell you this. I can't believe that it is the same man unless... I encounter him in the flesh. Unless he is able to reveal to me that this, in fact, is the same man who suffered and was broken on the cross. I want to be able to touch his wounds. I want to be able to see that this is the one who was broken. Oh, I want to see him glorified, but for me to know that this is the Lord, the Messiah, the Savior, I need to know that he's the same one who was broken. And Thomas is right. You know, we would not celebrate Easter if Jesus had not suffered and died. We wouldn't celebrate his ascension into heaven if he had not truly entered into the full experience of what it is to be a human being, because there would be no redemption if there was no atonement. There would be no forgiveness if there was no death on the cross. Scripture tells us that It is in Jesus' brokenness that we experience our healing. It's not that Jesus was willing to be glorified for our salvation. He was already glorified. Scripture says that he was equal with God in every way. Jesus is Alpha and Omega. It's not that Jesus was glorified or that he ascended into heaven. It's where he came from in the first place. It's that he was willing to be broken so that we could be made whole. It's that he was willing to endure the shame of the cross so that we could be liberated from the shame of our sin. Thomas was right to want to probe the brokenness of Jesus so that he might know that indeed this is the Savior, the one who has come to deliver them all. Our passage goes on in verse 26 and says this, A week later, his disciples were in the house again. And Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, 
put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Jesus knew Thomas's need. He knew Thomas's need to touch and to feel his brokenness, to know that it is more than just the highs in life that are redeemed and that are glorified, but even the lowest of lows are given purpose and meaning. They are endowed with redemption itself. This is what Jesus knew Thomas had in his heart. And what's more, he knows the same is true for me and for you. For most of us, we understand brokenness more than wholeness. We, we can understand suffering and hardship, grief and despair, more than we can wrap our mind around a, a heaven that has none of that. Because, of course, this has been our only experience. For all of humanity, from the moment Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden right up until this very day, humanity has been subjected to brokenness, to the suffering that comes from sin in a world that got flipped upside down. And so, of course, Jesus knows our need. Of course, He knows that it is His brokenness with which we will identify. And friends, listen to this. Jesus' resurrection, His appearance to Thomas, His willingness to bear His scars even into eternity tells us this, that even our brokenness is redeemed by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that though we are broken, we are yet beautiful in eternity. There is no question but that Jesus' resurrected appearance demonstrates to us that there is even beauty endowed to our brokenness. For those who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That He doesn't just redeem the holy, pure, clean parts of our lives. But He redeems even the worst, hardest, deepest levels of brokenness we experience in our lives. And He gives glory and meaning and purpose to it all. Jesus came to Thomas just as he comes to all of us and says, look upon me. Touch me, feel me, know me. Know my wounds and my brokenness and know that I am the God who was willing to suffer on your behalf to give meaning and purpose to every hardship you endure. And listen to Thomas's response. Verse 28, Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus revealed himself in his woundedness. He made himself known through his brokenness. I want you to think about what that means of the character of who Jesus, who our God really is. Jesus was willing to have 
his wounds probed by Thomas so that even one man might believe. How great is the love of our God. That he is willing not only to suffer and to die, to bear our humiliation to the cross, but he's then even willing to have us probe his wounds, to put our fingers in the places of his humiliation, just so that we might believe and be saved. We celebrate the resurrection on this great day because Jesus is willing for us to experience healing and hope even from the worst, most tragic, broken parts of our identity. Here's what that means for you, wherever you are, whoever you are. Whatever your life has been up to this moment. Jesus knows your need. Even before you speak it. There is nothing that you have done or said. There is nowhere that you have gone. No act that you have committed. No words that you have spoken. There is no suffering you have endured. There is no hardship you have weathered that is insignificant to your God, to the one who created you, who formed you in his image. There is no sin you have committed that is beyond the forgiving and redemption of Jesus Christ. What's more, there is no brokenness There is no scar, whether physical, emotional, or spiritual, that is beyond the redeeming power of the resurrected Savior. Hear me. Because Jesus suffered and died and rose with his wounds still visible, we know that even the worst that we endure is redeemed in the end. On this Easter, like the very first disciples, we find ourselves behind locked doors. Find ourselves distant from one another, worried about what's going on out there. And yet, as you invite us into your home on this day, Hear me when I say, we have seen the Lord. He is alive. He is not dead. The grave is not empty. We have experienced Him. We have seen Him. We have touched His brokenness. And what's more, we have experienced the healing from our own brokenness that His resurrection provides. And if you want to know Him, I am certain that He can show up in your home too. And I pray to him that you will invite him in to welcome him as your Easter guest in your home. And to know that just as he was so long ago, even now, even today, he offers himself for your healing, for your forgiveness, for your redemption. And for your salvation. Church, I want to pray over you now. And as I do, if you there today need healing from your own brokenness, if you need hope from the challenges you face, if you need salvation, for the sins you have committed against God, against others, against yourself. Today is a great day to put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ. He is present there with you. He makes himself known. 
and he offers himself for your sake. Almighty God, I lift up the church that is assembled all over Waco, all over Texas, the United States, and the world. Who have gathered together around their computer, their TV, their device for this time of Easter worship. And I pray, O oh God, that even as they have invited this worship broadcast into their homes, so I pray also they would invite you to come in and to make yourself known and that you might show up behind locked doors around the world and allow broken, hurting people who are in need of help and healing and hope to experience the power of your presence right there among them on this day. Lord, I pray that you would heal the sick, that you would bind up the brokenhearted, and that you would deliver hope to those who live in darkness. God, I pray that you would unite and bind your church together on this great Easter Sunday. That Christians around the world would be stirred even as they were on the first Easter so long ago. May we receive you into our homes. May we receive you into our hearts. And may we declare that ancient affirmation first spoken by Thomas. My Lord and my God. Thank you, Lord, for this special time in which we can lift our voices in praise and thanksgiving to the salvation you have delivered in the resurrection of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ. It's in His Glorious name we pray. Amen. I hear the once was crowned with thorns. He is crowned with glory now. The Savior now to wash our feet. Now at his feet. The one who wore our sin and shame Now robed in majesty The radiance of perfect love Now shines for all to see
by your spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat the resurrected king is resurrecting me in your name I come alive to declare your victory the resurrected king is resurrecting me by your spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat the resurrected king is resurrecting me in your name I come alive to declare a victory the resurrected king is resurrecting me by your spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat the170 years, First Methodist Waco has been thriving in this community. This church has thrived through Vietnam, through World War II, uh, through the Great Depression, through World War I. This church has thrived for 170 years, facing down any challenge that came its way. And what that reveals, even now in our current circumstance and challenges is that the reason First Methodist has endured is that her great strength is not in her beautiful buildings, but in her people, in our commitment to Jesus Christ and to teaching and learning His Word. This morning, this Easter day, I want you to hear this. First Methodist will thrive through this current challenge and beyond. And it's because of you. 
It is because of your faithfulness. It is because of who God has created you to be for this community of faith and for this city and for our world. I hope you will take an opportunity to continue to give faithfully as you have in these last many weeks. You can do that by giving online on our app, by mailing a check into the church. When you do that, you are sharing the gifts that God is giving to you. You're returning just a small portion of the blessing that He has given to you so that our whole community can be enriched. And in these days, as our community shares with each other, it's not just us, but it's everyone around the world who is participating in our worship broadcasts, in our devotional life, in our Bible studies and Sunday school classes. If you are one of the blessed that continues to be gainfully employed during this season, I hope you will give generously in celebration that you even can do so and that you will do so on behalf of those who cannot. God bless you for your faithfulness and for your generosity. Truly, your generosity and faithfulness to the church during this time brings glory and honor to our triune God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. As we come to the end of our time of worship together, we are so glad that you have joined us on this Easter morning. We give God thanks for the ways that He works in all of our lives and our hearts. If today the Spirit stirred your heart, if there was a moment where you thought, I am hearing good news for the first time, or I have hope like I've never had before, and you want to talk to a pastor about that, we would love to do that. You can send us an email, you can click around on our website and get um, the church phone number, contact us, you can leave a message on Facebook. We would love to be able to connect with you and talk a little bit more about that because following Jesus, this resurrected Lord, is the very best thing um, that any of us could ever hope for. As we conclude today, I do want to share with you that there's also great resources for kids um, found on our website. Uh, Easter Jam, uh, an awesome opportunity for people to celebrate the resurrection and peep jousting and all sorts of fun stuff that Children's Ministry has prepared um, because we want everybody of all ages to be able to um, have a wonderful celebration on this Easter day. As we conclude our time together, let me pray for us. Holy Lord, we give you thanks for an opportunity to gather because it is the day worthy of our best celebration. You, Lord, have overcome darkness. You have trampled down death. You have come into life and you come to offer us life that is real life, life that is eternal, life that is with you. So Lord, we remember that there will be a day that we get to gather together again and celebrate in person with one another. We cannot wait for that day to come. But even more, we know that there will come a day where we get to stand at the base of your throne and shout, holy, holy, holy is the Lord and give you praise and thanks for you are worthy of everything we have. Lord, send us into this week with the power of your spirit Walk with us in each day, and may we honor and glorify you in everything we do. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>